One sat on the desk of President Roosevelt. Another was carried by the famous General Patton, along with his famous Colt revolvers. They served in every major theater of the war, with every military branch, and they earned their reputation as some of the most dependable blades of World War II. These are the Eck Commando Knives, the product of John Eck's desire to provide the American serviceman with the best knife possible. Today, we're going to be delving into the story of the Eck Knife, what they are, and where they come from. Let's get into it. With the U.S.'s entry into World War II, the country found itself greatly unprepared. In spite of this, the government began a rapid mobilization in order to counter the threats in the European and Pacific theaters. All arms and munitions were in short supply, but particularly lacking were knives for the American soldier. Upon entry into the war, the only official military knife was the M1918 Mark II trench knife. These knives had been ordered at the end of World War I and seen little service during that conflict. In fact, the majority of M1918 knives had been delivered after the Treaty of Versailles in 1918. After the conclusion of the Great War, the U.S. had seen little need for new knives. That proved to be unfortunately short-sighted. With the onset of World War II, U.S. Ordnance officers quickly exhausted the supply of M1918s available. Scraping the bottom of the barrel even further, the U.S. still had a number of 1917 trench knives on hand as well. These were little more than ice picks with knuckle guards. Regardless, those on hand were issued to troops. After all, pointy sticks have proven to be effective for millennia. While this helped to alleviate the problem, there was still a significant shortage. A random assortment of civilian hunting knives were also procured both by the government and by individual soldiers alike in a desperate attempt to equip themselves. In spite of the US government's best efforts, they were not able to quench the thirst for edged weapons. It is into this scene that John Eck and his knives enter. A great deal about John Eck is shrouded in mystery and lost to time, but there are some things we do know for sure. Mr. Eck was without a doubt a highly patriotic individual. Had he been permitted, he would have enlisted to fight in the armed forces, but had been a victim of an automotive accident in 1936 that left him with a crushed and disabled hand. Prior to that, Mr. Eck had served in the Connecticut State Guard and also been a scoutmaster. Exposure to etched weapons naturally came with these experiences. We also know that Mr. Eck underwent bayonet training and was rather unimpressed with the bayonet as a close quarters weapon. Additionally, he worked as a machinist, most likely fabricating maritime hardware. According to his son, Gary Eck, John Eck received a number of correspondence from troops complaining about the quality of their knives prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. These complaints would have been predominantly aimed at the M1918 trench knife. The heavy and large brass grip left something to be desired among US troops along with other issues. As a result, John Eck would start a knife company located in Hamden, Connecticut to produce superior blades in 1939. However, it was not until 1941 that the Hamden shop started producing knives in great quantities. The first and most popular knife would be John Eck's Style of One Dagger. The first mass-produced Eck knife was the Style One. It was a spear point blade measuring 7 inches or about 17.8 centimeters long with a sharpened back edge running about 1.5 inches or 3.8 centimeters long. Particularly interesting is the short bevels present on the Style 1 and subsequent Eck knives. Other knives at the time made use of the larger bevels we see on most knives. By contrast, the Style 1 was pretty beefy with the majority of the blade sitting at an eighth of an inch thick or about 0.3 centimeters thick. The grip of the knife was also fairly lengthy compared to many of its contemporaries. It made use of a robust full tan grip with a protruding tab at the butt of the knife. This functioned as the skull crusher feature that was popular throughout the war. Probably the most recognizable features of the knife were the grip scales. The scales were made of hardwood, predominantly rock maple, and carved with the signature Eck scallops to provide that good grip retention. These scales were then secured in place with lead rivets. How John Eck came up with his design isn't really known. His son, Gary Eck, had this to say on the subject. He took some cues from early American Indian arrowhead designs and mixed them with a British commando knife designed by Fairbairn and Sykes and made by the H.G. Slater Company in Sheffield, England, and merged that with his Swedish heritage of Viking sword making 
and hilting using a hot poured tin mixture to attach the hardwood hilts to the full tang blades. There are some issues with this take though. The Style 1 started coming out in large numbers in 1941. Incidentally, the first order for the FS daggers were placed in January of 1941, and only very limited quantities were able to be produced for the commando units until the end of 1942, when production really took off. It's possible there was an influence, but it seems unlikely. Gary's claim of using hot poured lead in the Viking tradition is also suspect. Viking blades made use of tin constructions with the pommels peened into place. I wasn't able to find any examples of lead rivets used in Viking blade construction. I suspect that the reality is that no one knows exactly where the design comes from, but I have a couple of speculations on where some inspiration might have come from. We know that John Eck believed that an unfixed bayonet was an unwieldy weapon in close quarters. The bayonet he most likely would have encountered as a guardsman was the M1905 for the 1903 Springfield rifle. The M1905 was a 16 inch or 40.6 centimeter spear point blade. The complaints Eck received from soldiers in 1939, again, were most likely aimed at the M1918 trench knife. The fragile blades of the M1918 in particular were unpopular. When compared to the M1905, a case could be made that the Style 1 is actually a truncated M1905 bayonet with the bevel shortened to beef up the strength of the blade. Another possibility was that like many other combat knives of the Second World War, John Eck took inspiration from pre-existing civilian hunting knives, particularly the Bowie knife. Many of the Sheffield Bowies from the 1800s also exhibited a thick spear point blade. I believe it is also possible that the Style 1 could be a scaled down buoy with acute bevels to keep the durability of a thick blade. Now, I will reiterate that these are just possible theories of where I think the Style 1 design may have come from. My question for you this video is do you think either of these theories are right? And if not, where do you think the Style 1 Eck originated from? Some of you may have noticed that the Style 1 lacks a guard, which is somewhat unusual for a fighting knife. John Eck believed that a knife with a good grip didn't have a need for a guard. Its only real purpose would have been to protect the wielder's hand from slipping down onto the blade. Furthermore, the guard was something clothing or other gear could snag on, inhibiting its deployment. Mr. Eck took his design to the US Government War Production Board, which questioned the lack of a guard. There are a couple variations of this story, but my personal favorite was that in response, he greased his hand and then drove one of his knives into the floor of the room as hard as he could. The knife didn't break, and Mr. X's hand remained firmly in place. Now, regardless of the truth of that story, John Eck did not receive an official contract to supply the military, but he did receive permission to produce his knives with materials that would have otherwise been rationed towards other purposes. These were quality nickel chrome molybdenum steel and lead recycled from spent bullets and wheel weights. Rock maple was a quality hardwood that could be repurposed from bed slats and furniture. In turn, Mr. Eck rewarded the trust to the production board by producing quality knives with what he had been given and mandating that only servicemen were permitted to purchase Eck knives. As the Hamden shop began scaling up production to meet wartime demand, many of the new employees John Eck hired were disabled individuals, much like Mr. Eck himself. While they couldn't fight, they were still able to contribute to the war effort and make a living for themselves. Also during this time period, Mr. Eck reached out to the British War Office to request permission to use the term commando for his knives. At the time, the term commando was used to refer to the Special Forces soldiers serving in the British commando units. Although the Fairbairn Sykes dagger was the knife used by the commando units, the Brits acquiesced and the Eck knife became the American Commando Dagger. Real quick, if you've been enjoying this video, consider subscribing or getting a supporting membership with the Knife Life. Now, let's discuss the next Eck knives. The Style 1 Eck was the most popular and most produced Eck knife, but it was far from the only Eck knife produced. There were 13 different styles of blades released from the Hamden shop, many of which were derivations of the original Style 1. The Style 2 was released shortly after the Style 1 and shared the same blade profile, but the back edge was sharpened the full length of the blade, turning the knife into a full double-edged dagger. 
While John Eck saw little use for a guard on his knives, there was sufficient enough feedback that he would eventually relent and release the Style 6 and 7. These were identical to the Styles 1 and 2 respectively, except for the addition of the guard. While the scalloped grip on the Style 1 is often what we associate with an Eck knife, the Style 3 strayed away from that shape to make use of a bolo grip. The bolo grip was more common on the other blades that Eck released. It was featured on the Style 4 New Guinea brush knife, the Style 8 paratrooper knife, and most notably the Style 5 navy knife, a 7 inch or 17.8 centimeter clip point knife. According to Eck's Your Silent Partner booklet, the grip would cause the knife to make a zigzag motion when dropped in the water, slowing down its descent and giving you more time to recover the knife. Whether or not the grip works as intended, I can't say. I don't have a bolo grip knife to test that out on, and the behavior wasn't advertised for the other knives with the same grip. I would expect that the Style 10 floating knife was more effective for marine recovery since its bolo grip was designed to, well, float. While the Navy knife started off with the bolo grip, it was also issued with the Eck scalloped grip. This was the Style 9 marine knife. It would also feature a version with a guard, the Style 11. There are a couple other designs, but we have covered the major styles released by John Eck. Much of the production in Hamden was done by hand, and as a result, there is a great deal of variation from knife to knife. Some grips have very distinct scallops ground into the grip, whereas others do not. Serial numbering was done on the earlier knives with a vibrating engraver. In addition to the variations due to the individuals making the knives, there are other variations that can be observed as the work progressed. The lead rivets started out smaller and then progressively got larger. Lanyard holes were drilled through the grip. Serial numbers were transitioned from being hand marked to being stamped. Interestingly enough, there were not separate serial numbers for each style of knife. Rather, each knife was marked with its serial number for a single contiguous number system. Collectors have used this information to estimate that less than 30,000 knives were produced by the Hampton shop. While the Eck knives were very widely respected and favored, they were reliant on private purchases made by individual soldiers. The Eck knives never reached the same degree of production as other government-issued knives, such as the Fairbairn Sykes or the K-Bar. However, because it was a privately purchased knife, the Eck saw use in all theaters of the war, from the Pacific to Europe, in the air and on the ground. Immediately after the war, demand for knives dropped off across the board. Troops were being demobilized around the globe, and while standing armies would still require equipment, the mass stockpiles the leftover kit from the war was more than enough to supply regular troops. Surplus World War II knives would be issued to troops until Vietnam, and you can still find them floating around in use. John X still fulfilled orders from active servicemen, but realized that he wouldn't be able to keep to that model in order to preserve his business. He attempted to broaden his market by branching out into kitchen knives, but it appears he was largely unsuccessful. At some point between 1949 and 1953, John Eck relocated to Florida. He engaged in a number of enterprises, running from the boating industry to firearms to law enforcement work. He did not resume making knives until towards the end of the 60s. Unfortunately, John Eck died in 1976, and the business was passed to his son, Gary Eck. In 1982, the company relocated to Virginia, where it produced a lot of limited edition commemorative blades. After Gary Eck sold the company in 1982, the rights to the Eck knife bounced around a bit. It was owned by the American Historical Foundation under Robert Berline, then transferred to Blackjack Knives, and then back to Berline again. Increasing prices, coupled with decreasing sales, resulted in the sale of Eck knives to Gaybar, who currently owns the rights to Eck knives. K-Bar was also kind enough to loan me the knives for this video. If you want to really delve into the post-war X, check out militarycarryknives.com. I'll have a link in the description. While the direct descendant of the X is currently produced by K-Bar, there are a number of recent creations that have drawn inspiration from the X knife. Most notable is a collaboration between Alan Leishwitz and Les George, two heavy hitters in the knife world. These knives are excellent homages to the original X knife, reconstructed in folder format. The two designers have worked on a couple different variations, but the most recent is an Integra folder machined out of titanium. 
essentially a miniaturized style wand that can be carried with you every day. I have a link to these in the description as well. For those interested in more World War II knife content, check out my video on the M1918 trench knife that the Eck knife was made to replace. Or check out a video on the K-Bar, one of the most popular contemporaries of the Eck knife. Until next time, stay safe and keep living the knife life.